Hey everyone, it's Jeremy Steiner, and today we're gonna make this grassy field texture in Substance Designer. In this tutorial, we're gonna work on managing our grayscale histogram levels, specifically with the histogram range node. Because this texture has multiple levels of detail, such as dead grass, mud, dirt, and small pebbles, it's important that we isolate and manage our levels of detail so that we can blend them together. We've got a lot to cover, so let's jump in and get started. Okay, so here's the material we're gonna be creating today, and it's this wet grass field texture. And so let's zoom in a little bit. You can see we have a bunch of layers to this material. We've got the main grass, we've also got some dirt, and we have some dead grass poking in here. And I'm just gonna adjust a little bit of the light here so you can sort of see the detail that we're getting here. I'm doing this in iRay because the reflections in iRay are much more accurate. We are gonna be focusing a lot on roughness in this tutorial today. Also with one slider here, I can remove a bunch of the grass. So now you can see we have much more dirt and this field now feels like it's been walked over or people have gone running or uh, you know animals or dogs have been running all through a park or something like that. Uh, and that's just with one simple slider. I can also take another slider and bring in some more dead grass. And if I zoom in here, you can see you've got more of that dead grass poking through. And then finally, I can take another slider here and bring in a bunch more of these pebbles, these small rocks that are scattered about throughout the material, and I can add a bunch more. So you can see that this material is pretty dynamic. There's a bunch of layers, and there's a lot that we can do with it. We can customize with it after the fact. All right, so let's build this graph. So I'm gonna go to File, New Substance. So we're using the PBR Metallic Roughness Template, and I'm gonna call this graph Wet grass field and size mode absolute. Let's go with 2K and let's hit okay. So to set up my workspace and my graph a little bit, first of all, I'm using the rounded cylinder. So if we go to scene, choose rounded cylinder here. And then I'm gonna to go to materials, default physically metallic roughness and choose tessellation. And I'm gonna bring up the tessellation factor all the way up to, actually let's increase this to 24. And depending on your computer's processor and speed, you can adjust this. I find 24 is pretty good. And then for scale, we can play with that in a minute as soon as we get some height information. So now what I'm gonna do here is add what I call a final blend. So I'm gonna hit spacebar, bring in a blend. And this blend is what I hook up all of my height information to, and it routes it to the normal and the ambient occlusion and the height, just so I have one connection point that I can easily preview what's going on in the 3D view. So I'm gonna take the blend output here, bring it into the normal, and I'm going to delete these two uniform colors here connected to my ambient occlusion and height. First, I'm gonna bring in an ambient occlusion node. This converts the height information into ambient occlusion information here and connect that up here. And then I'm also gonna connect the blend to this height. So we have this final blend here connected to the normal, the ambient occlusion conversion, and our height output. So we're going to build up this texture one component at a time, starting with the blades of grass. And unlike some of my previous tutorials, we're not gonna wait for all of the height information from all of our components to be built before adding more attributes such as roughness and color. So instead, we're gonna build them on layer by layer. And that first component we're going to make is our blade of grass shape. So let's get started here. I'm gonna click on my graph, I'm gonna hit spacebar, and I'm gonna type in shape. We're gonna make a shape node. And the shape we wanna make is a tall, thin rectangle. So I'm gonna to go to pattern and make sure it's a square. And then I'm gonna take the size and I'm gonna bring the X all the way down here. 0 0.03 is good. And then I'm gonna shorten it a little bit. 0.7 on the Y. And so now I want to add some dimension to this shape. Right now it's very simple, very flat. So an easy way to add dimension to a black and white shape is with something called a non-uniform blur. So I'm gonna click on my shape, hit spacebar and type in non-uniform blur grayscale. And what I need to do is, you see it automatically brought it into the grayscale 
default input of our blur, but I also want to bring the shape into the blur map input as well. And you can see that this starts to do something. If I increase the samples all the way up to 16, the blades all the way up to nine, and then I can adjust this intensity here. You can see it gives it sort of a rounded, more three-dimensional look. So I'm going to adjust our intensity a little bit more. Let's bring it up to 3.17. So I want to vary up this height a little bit by adding a noise, which will create some random peaks and valleys. So what I want to do is make a new blend. And I'm going to bring in a Perlin noise. Let's bring this Perlin noise into the foreground of the blend. And our blade of grass here from the non-uniform blur into the background. And let's change the blend mode to multiply. And so now we're starting to get those peaks and, and valleys here in the height dimension, but let's dial this in a little bit more. So I want to adjust the scale of our Perlin noise a little bit. So I'm double clicking on the Perlin noise and bringing the scale down. Something like 15 is okay here. And let's double click on our blend and let's play with this opacity. See how much of that information we want on our blade of grass here. 0.61 is looking good. You can see we're getting a little bit of that variation. And so to add even more variation to our blade of grass here, I'm going to bend it organically using a Perlin noise and a directional warp. So let's bring in that directional warp, spacebar, directional warp. And the thing that we're going to warp is our blend node here. And then in our intensity input, I'm gonna bring in another Perlin noise. And I'm going to set this Perlin noise to something different. So I'm not going to borrow the same Perlin noise that we used before. I'm going to change this scale to something much larger, or in this case, bring it down to something like seven so that we get these much larger organic patches of grayscale values. And let's bring that Perlin noise into the intensity input and double click on the directional warp. So we're just pushing it around a little. And now I can adjust this intensity. Don't want to bend it too much because I want these grass blades to hold up on their own from far away. 8.1 looks good. And then we can change this warp angle here. So I'm thinking, yeah, something like that. So this brings me to one of the points I'd like to make about managing our levels and histogram. Every time we multiply down some height information with a blend node, our overall levels get darker and darker. You can see if I start off here, we've got a nice bright shape here, and then we start multiplying things on and things start to get dark, and we start to compress our histogram into the lower range. And so it's important to keep this in mind when you start layering on shapes and blend nodes. And so one way to fix this is to use a levels node to visually tweak the height information to get things back to a workable range that you're comfortable with. So I'm going to click on my directional warp out of levels. And in this case, we just need to brighten things up in the mid range a little bit without changing anything like our overall black and white clamps here on the bottom left and right. So I'm going to use this middle top triangle to just adjust our mid range values. And so we can check back to before we multiplied anything to see if we're back to a similar range. So I'm going to go to the non uniform blur, which is before we multiply anything, we see we have these levels. And then if I go back to the levels here, we're getting something pretty similar in terms of how bright it is. And so now let's take a look at some reference of some blades of grass. Notice how each of these blades have these thin lines dividing these blades into sections. We can easily add these with a stripes node. So back on our graph, let's make some room. I'm just going to pull all these nodes over to the left. So I'm going to hit spacebar, bring in a stripes. And this is what we get by default. You can see they're going in a diagonal direction here. I can take this shift parameter and drag it all the way to the left. And that's going to make these go horizontally. And then I want to increase these stripes quite a bit. In fact, I'm going to bring it all the way up to 200. And I want to adjust these parameters a little bit more. So I'm going to change the width of these stripes to be something a little bit more cohesive. So I'm going to bring this up to one. And then what I can do is I can increase the softness value and that's going to refine these stripes a little bit more and give them a, a rounded gradient sort of blurred edge here. So I can bring up the softness, not too much. I still want them to be significant, something like 0.26. 
You notice these stripes aren't uniform as well. We have these gaps that are all different sizes here, and that's part of this stripes node, giving us some extra variation, which is nice. And so they're going in a horizontal direction. Let's rotate them with a safe transform to make them go up and down like our blades of grass have it. So I'm just going to take the rotation, hold shift, and bring this to 90 degrees. So now we're doing vertical lines. And now let's blend them onto our blades of grass. So bring in a blend node. And so because I'm blending the stripes onto the blade of grass, I'm going to take my safe transform with those stripes and bring it into the foreground here. Let's make some, some room here and adjust this. And then since we're blending onto our blades of grass, let's put them in the background. And we're going to change our blending mode to subtract. We're going to subtract these bright white values from our blade of grass. And let's change our opacity. We still want the main form of our grass shape to shine through here. So 0.1 looking good. We still have these lines. We still have the main form. Now I want to give our grass shape some overall height information and make it gradually rise up from the base of our blade to the top as, as if it's growing from the ground. So what I'm going to do is bring in a gradient linear one node and that's just a simple gradient going from black to white from bottom to top. And I'm going to hit spacebar, bring in a blend and again, we're blending on our gradient linear one. So I'm going to bring it into the foreground and then take our previous blend into the background, double click on our blend, and let's change this blend mode to multiply. So now we can see it's growing from bottom to top. We've got a smooth black to white gradient multiplied on to our grass shape here. And so this is our blade of grass component. So I'm going to select all these nodes, hit spacebar, Type in frame, and let's call this blade of grass shape. And so this is how we're going to divide our graph into components so that we can easily keep ourselves organized. Don't forget to save. Next up, I want to create a clump of grass that we can then scatter around to create a natural, tileable field of grass. You can count how many times I'm going to say grass in this tutorial. So first up, I'm going to bring in a new shape. And let's go to the pattern and let's choose thorn. And so you can see we've got this small point in the middle that kind of fades out into the rest of the square. And so next up, I'm going to convert this grayscale information into normal information. So I'm going to click on the node, hit spacebar, and type in normal. And so now let me just increase the intensity so you can see what's going on here. Now this is normal information. And with that, we can drive our tile sampler to do some pretty cool things. So let's bring in that tile sampler. And so the tile sampler is what we're going to use to create a clump of grass out of our base shape here. And so we've got this pattern one input here in the tile sampler, and that's where we bring in our blade of grass so it knows what shape to tile about. And let's change the pattern parameter to pattern input so it knows to use this input. And so let's also connect these nodes to a couple of our inputs here. Let's take our normal output here and plug this into the vector map input. It's the only orange connection that the base tile sampler has. We're also going to take the shape and plug this into a couple of these inputs. And the first one's going to be the scale map input and also the mask map input. So let's just move this around a little bit so you can see where these connections are going. We've got our shape going into our normal, and our normal is going into our vector map input, and then we also have our shape with the grayscale information going into the scale map input and the mask map input. So with all of our inputs set up and our tile sampler set to pattern input, let's adjust some more of these settings. So I want a bunch more of these blades of grass tiling about. So let's increase the X and Y amount. I'm going to say 37 by 45. Got a bunch of these small little blades here. And so they're really small right now. So let's scroll down to size and bring up the scale. Let's bring it up to 10. I'm going to scroll down to rotation and I'm going to find this vector map 
multiplier. And so now we've plugged our normal into this vector map input. So now if we bring up the vector map multiplier, you're going to see that these tiles or these blades of grass are now rotating in accordance to this normal information that we've inputted, which is very cool. So I'm going to keep that vector map multiplier at 1. And so let's vary up this clump a little bit. So I'm going to go back to size. And let's increase the scale random here, something like 0.65. And let's take the position random. And so let's vary these up just a little bit. And now we also plugged in our grayscale shape here, this thorn, into the scale map. So if I take the scale map multiplier under the size parameters and increase that, It's using these grayscale values to determine how large these blades of grass are. So you can see now we have small ones where it's darker and where it's lighter in the thorn, we've got our larger shapes. But we still have too many of these small outlining tiles, so we also plug this shape into the mask map input. So if I scroll all the way down to the color parameters and look at this mask map threshold, if I drag this to the right, it's going to start masking off all those extra ones based on the same grayscale thorn shape that we used. So I don't want to take off too many of these shapes. Let's dial this back to something like yeah, 0.32. And they're still kind of moving in this swirly circular pattern, so I want to adjust the rotation even more and bring up the rotation random. And there we go. Now we're getting this clump of grass. 0.15 there for rotation random. And so now that we have this clump of grass, let's scatter it about with another tile sampler. Click off and bring in a tile sampler. And let's put the output of our first tile sampler into the pattern one input of our new tile sampler. And so we can see what we're doing. Let's change the pattern to pattern input. And let's increase this. I want a bunch of these clumps. So I'm going 39 by 39. And we can't really see anything now, so let's really increase the scale. And so 10 isn't really going to be enough here. Let's, let's do it even more. I'm going to type in 40. We can adjust and bring in some randomization of that scale. That's looking pretty good. And now let's do some position random as well. And might as well crank this all the way up to 10. And so we're getting a pretty good field of grass here, but I think we can increase the variation sort of organically even more so using another one of these inputs in the tile sampler. And that's with the displacement map input. So I'm going to bring in another Perlin noise, spacebar, Perlin noise. And I'm going to connect this Perlin noise to that displacement map input. And I'm going to adjust the scale on the Perlin noise to be not too big because I still want this to look natural. So I'm going to bring down the scale quite a bit to three, I'm thinking. And so if I double click the tile sampler, come down to position, we have this displacement map intensity and displacement angle. And so watch how as I bring up the displacement map intensity, it's pushing those tiles, those clumps that we made based on the Perlin noise and its grayscale values. And it's pushing them in the direction of this displacement angle. So I can move this down. You can see how it's clumping them up in this direction, mainly towards the left here. So I don't want to go too much because I don't want them to clump together. But this is how we can create our clumps of grass in a very organic fashion. 0.23 is looking good here. And so now to see what we're doing with our height information, Let's connect our tile sampler. I'm just going to bring it into the foreground of that final blend. You can see what's going on here. And so now we can adjust our materials and bring in some scale here. So I'm going to increase the scale just a tiny bit. We can start to see our shapes. And now it's looking very shiny. So I'm just going to arbitrarily double click on the uniform color connected to our roughness. And I'm just going to bring this slider up. So that's looking a bit more natural looking. 
So let's take a look at some of these curvature nodes. And before I want to do that, let's just organize our graph some more. So I'm going to select those nodes that we scattered our clumps of grass in and frame them up. And I'm just going to call it tile grass and just bring it down here a little. And I'm going to continue to bring the rest of our nodes over to the left to make some more room. A big part of this material is creating and dialing in the roughness values. Representing multiple material types in one texture is one of the things that makes Substance Designer so powerful. And to do that, we specify where certain parts of our material are shiny and where others are rough and non-reflective. The goal is to make our blades of grass shiny as if it had recently rained, but make everywhere else a bit more rough. We know that our roughness map is made of grayscale values. Everywhere that is black is reflective, and everywhere that is white is not. Now we need to isolate the outlines of our shapes and determine by how much those shapes bend and twist. We can then use that information to gauge where our shapes are bumpy or smooth. Luckily, Substance Designer has a couple of nodes that can do this, and they are the curvature nodes. So I'm going to bring in the three curvature nodes. Spacebar, we've got curvature, curvature smooth, and curvature sabel. And so you can see all three of these nodes require a normal input. I'm going to bring in a normal node, and I'm going to take our tile samplers output, bring it into this normal node. You can see we get all our normal information here. And so let's take a look at what makes all three of these different. So I'm going to plug this normal node into the curvature one at the top, the normal one. And let's connect this to the curvature smooth and the curvature sabel. Notice how the curvature smooth creates smooth gradients with very little outline, while the other two isolate the shapes a bit more. The standard curvature node outlines the shapes, but is a bit aliased with these sharp edges around our shapes, while the curvature sabel adds more of an outline and is a bit smoother. Each one of them have their place, and we're going to use a couple of these depending on what kind of roughness values we want to create. So I'm going to delete all three of these, and we're going to create the roughness for the patches of grass that we just created. So I'm going to keep this normal node that we made, and after it, I'm going to bring in the curvature sobel. And the reason why I'm using the Sobel version is because we're going to be looking at this from pretty far away, and I want those roughness values to really show off. I want those outlines to be clear so that we can distinguish these blades of grass with those roughness values and see it from a further distance. So as it stands, the blades of grass are the lighter parts of the map, and everything else is darker, and we want to invert that. So after clicking on the curvature Sobel, we're going to hit spacebar and bring in an invert grayscale. And so let's hook this up to our roughness here. I'm going to delete the uniform color that we're using to drive our roughness and connect our invert grayscale to the roughness. Let's see what we got here. So if I control shift and right click, we can see what we're getting. There's a little bit of shininess here appearing on just the blades of grass, and it's all overall a bit too shiny for my liking. So let's bring in a levels to overall brighten the roughness map and make things less shiny. So I'm going to select the invert grayscale, bring in a levels. And so I'm going to take this bottom left triangle and bring it to the right to brighten up the entire map here. And so this is brightening up our roughness map, but still maintaining the ranges that we established with the curvature Sabel node. And the best way to see really what our roughness values are doing is go back to our iRay renderer. And so we can rotate the light a little bit and see how our blades of grass are reflecting that light. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another frame. And this is going to be titled Roughness. And I'm going to make this a sort of a dark, let's make it a black color here. And I'm going to increase the size of this frame because we're going to put all of our roughness information into this frame. So it's easier to distinguish what's going on in our graph. Let's bring the rest of our outputs over here to the right so we can make some more room. And so now let's color in our grass because we're doing things one component at a time here. Up here is where I'm going to put our color information. So I'm going to start off by clicking in our graph and bringing in a gradient map. And I'm going to connect 
the output of our tile sampler here with our clumps of grass into that gradient map. And so we use gradient map to quickly color all of our materials. And there are many other ways to do it, but I find this is the quickest way because we're using reference images and we can sample those gradients from those reference images to get more realistic values. So to do that, we can use the gradient editor and we can choose the pick gradient button. It's going to populate this with a bunch of keys mapped to our black and white values here. So I'm going to click pick gradient here. I've got my reference up here and I can just drag across and it's going to populate these keys. And to see better what we're doing, I'm just going to connect our gradient map to our base color output and get rid of that default uniform color from our template so we can see what's going on with our grass here as we're creating these keys. So back to the gradient map. Let's go to the gradient editor. And so here's another gradient, and we can do a bunch of things like select these keys and bring up the value or lower the saturation. And so we can really adjust these in any way we choose to create whatever kind of grass it is that you are looking for. So I've picked my gradient here and I've chosen these keys and I've gone for like a more realistic, less saturated version, but you can also go for a brighter green and a more stylized approach. So I'm going to close the gradient editor and we can see what our grass is starting to look like. I'm just going to adjust the light here a bit. Now for our next layer of detail, let's create a dead grass component to blend in with our live grass. Here's what our graph looks like. Let's do the same thing that we did before with our roughness and let's do the same thing for color. So I'm just going to call this albedo slash color and uh, make it black here and just create a big frame that we're going to use in the future to just place all of our color information. And so for our next component for our dead grass, let's start off by creating a scratches generator. And this node can be used for so many things. You can use it for wear and tear on metal surfaces. You can create twigs. But in this case, we're going to create a bunch of dead grass with it. And we've got a bunch of fun parameters to play with. So if I double click on it, you can see we've got spline number and we've got some spline scale, distortion, all really fun things. And so I want to increase the amount of splines we have. So I'm going to choose a much larger number. Let's go with 25,000. So now we have a bunch of these splines. And they're a bit too long to be blades of grass. So let's bring down the spline scale. Now, I've done this a couple times where I've confused the spline width with the spline scale. The spline width changes how wide each strand is. And the spline scale shortens and lengthens each of these splines. So we want these bits of dead grass to be much smaller in case some of them have broken apart once they've dried out and withered away. So much smaller here. And let's play with the spline distortion to make them seem much more shriveled. 0.5. And now after the scratches generator, let's bring in a blur high quality grayscale. And let's bring down this intensity quite a bit. Let's type in a value like 0.15, really small. And let's bring the quality to 1. So the reason I've thrown in a blur here is to soften the edges of these splines. Without the blur, the edges would tear the geometry and the dead grass wouldn't really blend in as smoothly either. And so next up, I'm going to bring in two more nodes and this will bring us into the really the main topic of this tutorial. So after the blur high quality grayscale, I'm going to throw in a histogram range and I'm also going to throw in a height blend. And so take a look at how I'm going to organize this. So I'm going to look at my graph. I'm going to bring the roughness down, keep the color up here. And I'm going to create what I like to call a blend line. I use this blend line to stack all of the blends that contribute to our height information so that it seems more like we're adding things on top of each other as we go across. And it's more like layers in Photoshop in a sense that you can visually see how the height information is being added on top of one another or blended together. So I've taken our height blend and I've put it here. I'm going to frame it up. I'm going to make this one dark again as well. Call it blend line. And I'm just going to increase the size of this frame so that we have room to create this line. And so on top, I want to have our main alive grass. So I'm going to put that into the height top. And then 
the part that's poking through from the bottom, that's going to be the dead grass. So I'm going to grab that histogram range that we just created, which is connected to everything else in our dead grass component, and bring that into the height bottom. And while we're at it, let's just frame this up and call it dead grass. And so let's take a look at this histogram range here. Notice how if I increase or decrease the histogram range, it's flattening out our values and using more or less of our histogram with our height information. So I'm going to decrease the range. Let's go to, yeah, 0.22. And so now we have a much flatter image. So let's pretend that this is our texture from the side and we have a bunch of grass on the top. And this is the layer that we're blending on with our height blend. Now, if we squished in our histogram with our histogram range, now we can easily move that entire layer and adjust the height depth with our height blend. Now, if we expanded and gave us more histogram range from that layer, now we have much more fine-tuned control as to what part of that height information in that layer would poke through or blend in with the layer that we're blending with. It all depends on how you'd like to blend your height information. With more information, you can then choose which part of that new layer is poking through. Or if you want to take the entire layer itself and move it a lot easier, you can then squish that histogram. So now if I go to our height blend, and so I'm going to take this blended height output. That's what has our grayscale information with the two layers blended together. And I'm going to take that output and plug it into the foreground of our final blend. So we can see what's going on here in our 3D view. And so now if I change the height offset and I bring it down, you can see we're getting our dead grass. Those are the squiggly lines this way. And if I bring the height offset to the right, you can see that our regular grass is poking through. And so because we flattened our dead grass off, it's much easier to sort of blend this all together as a whole. So 0.54 is looking like a good mash up between the two of these. And we'll see this a lot better when we start adding some color information to our dead grass. What I'm also going to do is take the contrast of our height blend and bring this all the way up to the right. So in order to see our dead grass better, let's color it in. So I'm going to go to our color information here and I'm going to bring in another gradient map and we'll connect our dead grass, which is our histogram range here from our dead grass component into the gradient map. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to sample some keys from some dead grass images. So I've got my reference imagery here. Let's bring up the gradient editor, pick gradient, and I'm going to choose this, this piece here. And let's blend these two gradient maps together so that we can see what we're doing. So I'm going to bring in a new blend in the foreground. And so the layering of this is really important. Let's bring the main grass into the foreground and let's bring the dead grass gradient map into the background. And now we need to drive this opacity with a mask. And luckily, our height blend creates a mask for us. And this is one of the benefits of using a height blend is that it creates this grayscale mask where the height top and the height bottom intersect. And you can tighten this mask based on this contrast parameter. So you can see if I bring down the contrast, we're getting more and more grayscale values in our mask. And in this case, I just want to tighten this up. So bring it to one. Let's take this height mask output. And I'm previewing this connection just by double clicking it here. You can do that with any of these circles. Let's take that height mask and put it into the opacity of our blend. Double click that. And you can see what's going on here. And so what's important is that everything that is white is where the foreground is going to show through and everything else is going to be where the background is. So let's take the output of this blend we just made and let's plug that into the base color. Now I can start to see what's happening. And I'm not quite sure if I like that gradient yet, but it's much easier to see now that it's plugged into our base color. So I'm going to go back, bring up my reference imagery here, and select another gradient. So I think that's looking better. So now I've got our dead grass showing through in parts of our live grass. And this is all controllable with this height blend. If I adjust the height offset, we can add more or less of this dead grass here. And so I want to do a quick overview of what our graph looks like so far. We've got our components in blue here, starting off with our blade of grass shape. 
and then we tiled that grass to create the field of grass that we have. And we also have this dead grass component here, and we'll keep building on components as we go along. But we also have these three frames here. We've got the blend line, which I talked about before, which we're gonna have our height blends and all of this information here that's gonna build into our final blends to create our height information. And then we also have this roughness area that we've created and our albedo slash color information up here just to keep things organized. Our next layer of detail is the dirt ground that our grass sits upon. As I mentioned before, this particular texture is a wet grass, so the mud needs to portray that as well. And, and this means that the shapes that make up the mud and soil can be a bit larger and flowing while still having some form, which is showing that it's made up of tiny clumps of dirt. This also means that when it comes to the roughness, we're going to err on the darker side of the grayscale for a shinier result. So there are two parts to this component, a slightly uneven base and the smaller soil detail. Let's create the base first with a purlin noise. So I'm gonna bring the scale way down to four. And this is so we get a slightly sloping base to our ground. And because I don't want this base to roll and slope too much, I'm going to flatten this purlin noise with the histogram range, just like we did with our dead grass. So let's bring in a histogram range and let's bring down this range 0.26. For the soil detail, let's add a dirt noise. So spacebar on the graph here, dirt, and let's choose a dirt three. And so I like dirt three for this because we have these small clumps and it looks really good as height information. I'm gonna increase the scale to four because all these patches are quite small. I'm gonna add this, this really small detail. But this is where you can choose how to find your dirt is going to be. So let's blend them together. Bring in a blend. I'm gonna put the dirt into the foreground and the histogram range from our purlin noise into the background and change the blend mode to add because we want to add this dirt noise on top of our purlin noise base. And let's adjust the opacity so it's not overpowering the base too much. 0.27. And so now let's add a histogram range to this entire component here after the blend. And I'm going to really flatten this down because I want this ground to really sit on the bottom and not poke out too much. I want these levels to be quite flat. So something low, like 0.17, is looking good for me here. And so now we're gonna continue our blend line that we have up here by adding another height blend. So I'm gonna select this connection here, the one that's coming out of the blended height from our first height blend. And I'm gonna bring in a new height blend. So that puts it somewhere in the middle of this connection. I'm just gonna drag it over here. And so automatically it put the first height blend into the height bottom. And that's not exactly what we want. What we really want to do is move it to the height top because we want our dirt to be on the bottom and the rest of our stuff to sit on top of it. So I'm going to shift click this connection to take our first height blend out of the height bottom and just drag it into the height top. And so now I can take the histogram range from our dirt. And I'm just clicking with the middle mouse button to pan and drag here and then bringing it into the height bottom here. And so immediately you see it's doing something, it's blended them right in the middle. What I wanna do is bring up the contrast up to one and then let's adjust this offset. So I really do want the rest of the stuff to sit on top of the mud or dirt. We can see a little bit of it poking through now. The color hasn't been set yet. So it's just using the color information from our previous gradient map. I just want it slightly poking out here. 0 0.59 It's looking good. And let's frame up our dirt. Called mud slash dirt. And now let's define the roughness for this component. So to see this detail more clearly, I need to increase the resolution of our graph. So I'm gonna double click on the graph itself. And where we have these output size parameters, I'm gonna increase this to 12 so that it's actually 4K. You can see this gives us a little more detail to play with. We can start to see some of our dirt shining through our grass blades here. So what I'm gonna do is go to our roughness area here 
and create another normal node. And I'm going to plug our histogram range into that normal. And this time I'm going to use a curvature smooth node. And what I can do is I can refine this information with another levels. So let's bring in a levels and I'm going to crunch in these values quite a bit. I'm going to bring our top left and right triangles in to really add some contrast. And finally, I'm going to bring our bottom left triangle to bring all of our levels up to a higher grayscale value and it's kind of make this a much more overall rough result, but not too much because we still want this to be a, a wet soil mud component. And so this is what we've got for our roughness map here. And, and this is where I put my triangles. If you want to copy these parameters exactly, if you go to the top right here where these sliders are, click that. You can see you've got these parameters and these correspond with each of these triangles. And so you can copy in these values to get exactly what I have. But something like this, we've just clamped it in and we've increased the overall brightness to get something like this. And let's blend these two roughnesses together. So bring in a blend. And for the foreground, I'm going to have the levels from our blades of grass. And the background is going to be our dirt. And then for the opacity mask to distinguish the two, we're going to take that generated mask from our second height blend here. And I'm just going to drag that into opacity and now they're blending in together pretty nicely. And then let's hook this up into our roughness output. So now if I go into iRay, we can see how our mud is reflecting a lot more than the blades of grass are. We're getting that sort of wet, muddy field look coming in. Now to color in the dirt, let's get all of the dirt height information and remove everything else so that we can focus on just those grayscale values. So I'm going to go up to the albedo color section. I'm going to make a new blend. And I want to get the grayscale values from our mud and dirt. So we're going to that histogram range, borrowing another connection off of that, and bringing it into the foreground of this new blend. Then I want to go back to our height blend, use that height mask, and take another connection off of that and put it into the opacity input of the blend. So now we just have that grayscale information, but then cut out with that opacity mask that we created from the height blend. Using blend nodes is a great way to easily isolate these values. So next up, what we need to do is colorize those values with a gradient map. So I'm just going to pick some keys and gradients just like I did before. So here are the keys that I've picked. I've gone for a more brownish, reddish tone to distinguish the dirt from the dead grass. So let's blend this in now with our previous colors with a new blend. And I'm going to take the previous blend into the foreground and the new gradient map that we just created into the background and use that same height mask that we used from our second height blend and put that into the opacity. So now let's hook up that new blend into our base color. And now you can see that our dirt is shining through and it's separating itself from the dead grass here. And let's pop back into iRay and we can see a bit better how our dirt is blending in, especially with that roughness. The final piece to our grassy field texture are a bunch of small pebbles or rocks. Now I made a tutorial previously about how to quickly create some stylized rocks in Substance Designer and I'll link it above and below. But let's create some quickly now. We're going to start off with a soft round sphere and then push it and pull it until it becomes a hard rock. And I'll show you what I mean by starting off by creating a shape node. And let's double click on that, change the pattern to paraboloid. And I want to decrease the scale of this a little bit. This is going to be a small pebble. I also want to give it room around the edges so that when we start pushing and pulling it, it doesn't overlap or extend past our main square here. So 0.65 for the scale is good. Let's tighten the shape up with a levels node. And so what I can do is I can focus in this shape. I can bring in the top left triangle here, and then I can adjust this middle triangle. And you can see as I bring the middle triangle to the left, we're really tightening up this edge here. So we go from soft to a much harder edge. 
This edge also prevents the rock from smoothly fading into the ground. So to start pushing and pulling it, let's add a directional warp. And what I want to warp this by is a new purlin noise. Let's take the scale of this purlin noise down. Something like six. And let's plug that into the intensity input of the directional warp. And let's adjust some of these parameters. Yeah, so I really need to highly increase this intensity. So I'm going to type in 40. Zoom out here. You can see this more organic rock looking shape. Let's adjust it a little more. And we can adjust this warp angle. Try and find a better shape here. Great. And next up, I want to use a slope blur grayscale. And this is such a handy node. It does some pretty amazing things, especially when it comes to creating stones or rocks. But one of the things it does is allow us to fill out and expand, or another way to put it, inflate our shape. And to inflate shapes with a slope blur grayscale, you need to get the original shape and you need to blur it. We use a blur high quality grayscale. And so now if we connect this into our slope blur grayscale, you can see what's happening here. Just bringing up the samples all the way up to 32 and then changing the mode to min. And now if I adjust this intensity, it just sort of fills out that shape a little bit. And now let's directionally warp it again. So adding another directional warp after the slope blur grayscale. And I'm going to use the same purlin noise as before. So I'm going to plug that in also into this intensity input of the second directional warp. So it's, this purlin noise is driving both directional warps here. And let's change the angle. Let's go down here instead. And I really want to crank up the intensity. So I'm going to type in 50 here. So now we're getting more jagged edges, which is good, but not too much. And we're going to continue our pattern here by adding another slope blur grayscale. And so now instead of filling out the shape like we did with the last slope blur grayscale, I'm going to bring in a clouds too. If I plug this in to the slope, it's looking a bit crazy. So let's increase the samples to 32, change the mode to min, and let's adjust this intensity. And I think it's looking a bit too sharp. So I'm going to take this clouds too, and I'm going to add a regular blur onto it. And let's decrease this blur a little. And so now you can see that our slope is a bit more smooth. So if I reduce this intensity, you can control how sharp this rock is. And so because this is a small pebble that we're making, I want to keep it more smooth and less distracting from the rest of our field of grass. Now I want to give my pebble shape an overall height slope so that it gradually pokes out from the ground, very similarly to what we did with our regular blade of grass shape. So let's add another gradient linear one. And let's blend it. So let's take the gradient linear one into the foreground and the slope blur into the background. And we're going to use a blend mode called min darken. And let's adjust the opacity here. And you can see I can fade in that slope. And this is the overall shape of our pebble. So next, let's scatter this pebble about with another tile sampler. Let's put the pebble shape into the pattern one input. And so in order to see it, let's change the pattern to pattern input. And let's create a bunch of these pebbles. Increasing the X and Y amount also decreases the scale of each of these tiles. So I do want these to be small pebbles. So 0.61 for scale, but then I can randomize the scale to get all kinds of variations with the scale random parameter. And now let's position them all over the place. So I'm going to zoom out here and just bring up the position random. And we can just dial in where we want to place these rocks, preferably not on top of one another. And now what we can do is if we go down to the color parameters, let's mask off a bunch of these pebbles. And so with this mask random 
parameter, you can choose how many pebbles you have on your texture. And this makes it really easy to determine how many pebbles there are. So 0.83 is what I'm going to go for. You can always adjust this later. So like all of our other components, I'm going to add a histogram range. And I'm going to dial this down to flatten it just a little bit. And then I'm going to go back to our blend line and I'm going to make a new height blend. And so now I'm thinking of it like I want to put the pebbles on top of the rest of our texture. So I'm going to take the previous height blend and put it into the bottom so that I can place the pebbles on top of everything. So I'm going to bring the pebbles into the height top. And what I'm going to do, let's plug this height blend into our final blend so we can see what we're doing here. And we can see we've got some of these pebbles. So let's adjust the height offset. So the lower the height offset, the more the pebbles sink into the ground. I just want them to sink in a little bit, 0.43. Note that I'm not bringing the contrast all the way up to one because I still want some grayscale values in this height mask that the height blend creates. So I'm gonna frame up the component we made. Call it rocks slash pebbles. And let's just bring this over a little bit, keep things organized. And so like before, let's make the roughness for our rocks. I'm gonna extend the frame that we made for our roughness and bring in a normal node, just like before. And I'm gonna choose a curvature smooth for this one. Let's plug that normal map into the curvature smooth and I want to drive this normal map by the tile sampler and not the histogram range. So I want to get all these full grayscale values from the tile sampler without them being flattened by the histogram range. So I'm branching off a connection from that tile sampler, putting it into the normal input. And so now we can see we've got this really nice curvature map of our pebbles. So I want to blend this together with the previous roughness information that we have. So bring it a blend. Let's take the curvature smooth and put it into the foreground and the previous blend from our previous roughness into the background. And to drive this opacity mask, we're gonna to go to our last height blend here of the three that we have and use that height mask, put it into the opacity. And there we go. So let's plug in our roughness blend into the roughness output here. And now as we zoom into our pebbles, we're seeing that our grass is overriding the color of our pebbles, and that's because we haven't created any color information yet. So let's do that next. I'm gonna go up to our color frame that we've outlined here, and let's create another gradient map. And this gradient map is gonna get its height information from our height mask, not from the regular grayscale information, but you can also do it from a height mask. And that's why I kept the contrast at 0.9 instead of 1 so that we can keep this gradient information and also drive our gradient map with those grayscale values. So I'll just take that height mask, put it into the gradient map, and now I'm going to pick my keys from my reference just like I did with the other ones. So here are my keys, kept it really simple. You can see I've got some nice dark shading around here. And let's blend this in with our previous color blends. Bring in a new blend going to plug our new gradient map into the foreground with our previous color blend into the background and use the same mask from our height blend here. And then connect our last blend for our color information into the base color. And so now we can see we've got more natural looking pebbles where the grass isn't overriding the pebbles color information. So I'm going to view our full graph here just by hitting the F key. Let's take a look at our components. We've got our grass shape that we tiled. We've got our dead grass. We've got some mud and dirt. And we've added on our rocks. And so we've blended them all together with this blend line. And we've added our roughness and color information for each of those components. We took our roughness and put it into our roughness output. We've taken our color and put it into our base color output. And then we have our blend line here where we have a bunch of height blends where we've merged and stacked our height information. We've taken the last height blend with our blended height 
and put that into this final blend, which distributes it into our normal ambient occlusion and height outputs. Now we just need to do a couple of finishing touches to really make this material pop. The first thing we need to do is normalize our height information. If I look at our final blend, our height map is really flat, and that's because we've used our histogram ranges to compress the height information and make it easy to keep everything together so that our height blends have quick control to offset the top and bottom layers and keep everything together as a whole. But now we need to restore our grayscale values to a normalized level to make it easier to work with. And it's really easy to do that. So what I'm going to do is select the connection coming out of our last height blend, hit spacebar, and type in auto for auto levels. And I'm going to hit enter. And so a lot of things are going to happen here. You can see this has gotten really crazy. And that's because now all of our grayscale values are in a normalized range. So what we need to do now is go back to our materials and go to tessellation. And now we don't need as high of a scale value. So I can bring this scale all the way down. Something quite small and we can zoom in. And we can see another thing has changed as well. And that is our ambient occlusion has filled in some of the gaps a bit more. So if we go into the ambient occlusion conversion node that we added earlier at the beginning of this tutorial, we can adjust the height depth and we can tweak it so that we can fill in those shadows as much as we want to. We can increase it to make it much more of a contrasty dark field of grass, and we can decrease it here. I think for this case, I'm gonna keep it around 0.12. That kind of fills everything together. And so to take a really good look at this material, let's bring this back into iRay. And to make sure you're getting the most out of iRay, go to Scene, Edit, and make sure that your subdivision is set to parametric and that you change the number to 10. And this will give you a bunch of subdivisions and you can really see your blades of grass shine. Also because now we're getting the realistic reflection and roughness information from our texture. And so here is our wet grass field texture. So there you have it, a dynamic grassy field texture made in Substance Designer. Now, if you've used any of these techniques to create your own grassy field materials, I'd love to see it. Hit me up on social media and check out my accounts down below in the description. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, send me a DM, or hit me up in the comments down below. Also, I totally recommend following me on Twitter and Instagram. I put tons of behind the scenes there, and also some projects that I'm working on that may make it into future videos, and I might even put some discounts in for some of my training. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up. It lets me know that you're watching and that you'd like to see more tutorials like these. And if you'd like to see more videos, hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos. I'm Jeremy Siner. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.